We are live. Hey there, how is it going? It is your muscle building coach, Lee Hayward, with the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Live video chat. And today, what I'm going to be doing is hanging out here for the next hour and basically just having a conversation and answering any questions that you may have with regards to bodybuilding, fitness, building muscle, losing fat, any specific challenges that you are dealing with when it comes to your workout or nutrition program. Feel free to uh, post those questions, comments, and topics of discussion into our video and over our video chat today. So let's see what we got going on here. We have AJ is joining us. Hey, how's it going? Let's see now. And if you're brand new to these video chats, let me know. Uh, post in the comments the letter N if you are brand new to these video chats. And if you're a regular, you've tuned into these all the time, post the letter R. I like to know who's new, who's a regular. And just a second, now I'm going to get something to prop my phone up there so we can... Uh, do this properly. I'm down in my home gym here doing the video chat on my mobile phone. I've, I've been messing around trying because YouTube has changed the way the live streams work. Like normally I do them on my uh, my desktop computer in my office, but they've changed up the settings. And the last couple times I've had some issues streaming with their new and set up so i just said it's easier to do it on on the phone it actually works out a lot quicker and easier and i actually think the video quality is better so hey if, if it's cool with you I'll, I'll use my phone if it's coming through loud and clear on your end it's coming through loud and clear on my end let's keep it going all right let's see we have uh, games joining us dan's joining us titoka joining us hey how's it going from New Zealand. Wow, that's awesome. Jeffrey is joining us. Jeffrey's a regular to these video chats. Mo, Mr. Mo Tez, Mo is joining us. How's it going, Mo? Uh, let's see what else we got. All right, let's, any questions? I'm just, a lot of introductions there. And first off, I'm assuming this is coming through loud and clear. Just post in the comments and let me know if it is, because I've had some issues in the past where I've started answering questions and talking and flapping my, my lips here. And then next thing I know is nobody can hear a darn thing. So just let me know if it is coming through loud and clear. All right, let's see what we got here. Hearing you loud and clear. All right, thank you much. I appreciate that. All right, let's jump in. Uh, got some regulars, got some new people joining us. Awesome, cool. All right, we have a question here from Mr. Young Buddha. <laughs> Gotta love the username. Uh, opinion on consuming alcohol while making gains. I mean, you know, alcohol is not helping you build your build muscle. I mean, that's that's uh, you don't need me to tell you that, right? I mean, like, <laughs> just common sense will tell you that. Now, is it really going to hinder your progress? Not in moderation, right? Like, if if you really enjoy alcohol, you enjoy the social aspect of it and everything else, you can still make it work within moderation and make progress. Ideally, the best scenario is not to drink at all. Personally, I don't drink at all. I haven't drank alcohol since 2011 was the last time that I drank. And the reason that I actually know that is because that is the last time I competed in a bodybuilding competition. And when I started my pre-contest diet for the 2011 Newfoundland Provincial Bodybuilding Championships, I stopped drinking alcohol during my contest prep. And after the show was over, I'm like, you know, I really don't like drinking alcohol. Like the only reason I drank it to begin with is just to fit in socially, right? I never, ever bought it, never had alcohol in the house. It's just, if I went out to a social event or something like that, then I would, you know, people would say, Hey, have a drink. So I don't, oh, okay, I'll have a drink, right? Just, just go along with the crowd. But I never really enjoyed it. I wasn't much of a drinker and after, you know, I went six months of pre-contest dieting without drinking and I didn't miss it. After the show was over, I said, you know what? I really don't want to start drinking again. So I never did and I never touched it since. And I don't miss it because right? I, I wasn't getting any pleasure from it. And I feel if, if you can adopt that habit, you know, of being alcohol free, I mean, I think that's the best way to go. Now, with that being said, all the years, like most of my bodybuilding years before 2011 because I mean I started training in 1990 
And I mean, from basically, you know, all through the 90s, uh, you know, in, in the early 2000s and stuff, I mean, I would have a social drink, right? Like, you know, going out on the weekends or whatever, but I wouldn't get shit face drunk and anything like that, but I would have social drinks just to fit in. And I still made progress, I still made gains. So, I mean, yes, you can certainly do it, but it's not helping, right? I mean, like, so just, just use your own discretion on that. I mean, obviously the less you drink, the better it's gonna be. Anyway, let's see what else we got. Uh, here we have Mo's joining us. I think it's Mo or M M Mu <laughs> M U H. I can't even. Uh, Dan is new to the video chats. Hey Dan, how's it going? We have Jason from Rhode Island. Awesome. Uh, Jeffrey's got a question. He says, Lee, have you read the Four Hour Body by Tim Ferriss? If so, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I read that. Oh gosh, it was when it first came out. I mean, that book's been around now for, for several years, but I did read it and I basically went through the whole thing. It took a long time to read because that's a big meaty book. I actually downloaded it to Kindle and I went through it and a lot of stuff in there. Like I'm, I'm a big fan of, of Tim Ferriss's work. Uh, like I've read, you know, the four hour work week and I read the, you know, the four hour body and stuff like that. And I've listened to a lot of his podcasts and stuff. So I am a fan of his work, but I don't agree with everything he says. And the same thing, like with the four hour body, like I don't agree with everything there, but there is a lot of stuff that's food for thought, interesting. And I, I definitely think it's, it's a worthwhile read, but some of the stuff, like take it with a grain of salt. Like first off, like all, all these names, right? The, these four hour names, like Tim does not work four hours a week, right? The four hour work week, that is a crock of BS. He does, he works a heck of a lot more than four hours a week. Now, maybe he goes through phases, like if he's on holiday where he can get away and work four hours a week and maintain his business. But to do all the stuff he's doing, you know, the writing, the podcasts, the speaking engagements and, and everything else that he's doing, it takes a heck of a lot more than four hours. So don't get... You know, take it all with a grain of salt, right? Same thing with the body. It takes more than four hours to build a good body. So uh, the, the, the book title is, is just that. It's, it's a fancy name-catching title. But as far as the content's concerned, there is some good stuff in there. All right, what else we got? Um, doo -doo -doo. Looking nice with my glasses, someone's saying. Well, th thank you. Hi. I actually... Like, I, I, I can get away without my glasses. It's just like when I put them on, things are just a wee bit more sharper, right? Like, it's a very weak prescription, but it's it was enough that when I went and did a, I, I could notice, this is where I really noticed uh, that I could use glasses, is when I was at the grocery store and I'm trying to read the aisle signs and I'd be looking and it's like, man, they're getting a little blurry. Right, you know, you're reading the signs that says, okay, what, what's down each aisle? And it was just like, they were getting a little tiny bit blurry. Now I could still see everything, I could drive and I could do everything, but it's just like, it's not as sharp as it used to be. So I went and got an eye test and she said, yeah, you're just a very little bit of deterioration there. I mean, she's the, the eye doctor, she said, you know, there's nothing big there. You really, you don't need a prescription, but the way I am, I'm like, if if it's a if it's not perfect, right? If, if it's suboptimal, like, that pisses me off, right? I want to have optimal vision. So as soon as I didn't have 20-20 vision, I'm like, I want that back again. So uh, even though it's a weak prescription, I went ahead and got it. And it just sharpens everything up that little bit more, right? Because all my life I had 20-20 vision and I, you know, just really enjoy it. I mean, I like being able to see things crystal clear and not having a little bit of fuzz or haze. So that's why I went and got the glasses and I'm glad I did. But it's not like a must-have. I can function without them. Uh, Lena's joining us saying, do you think that the foods you don't eat are just as important on a diet? Interesting question. The foods that you don't eat. I would love some examples on this to really, uh, uh, kind of elaborate more on it, but this is the way I, I view dieting. It, it's, it's kind of different than the way a lot of people view it. Like, if, if you ask the average person like who says they want to go on a diet, sometimes they'll say, well, I need to cut out this and I need to cut out that, right? I need to cut out the, the junk food and I need to cut out, you know, the, the, the sweets and whatever, fatty foods, fried foods, blah, blah, blah. I need to cut all that out. And 
To a degree, yeah, they're absolutely right. You know, you, you do need to, or at least minimize that. But I take a different approach. Instead of focusing on all, all the stuff you have to cut out or eliminate, I like to tell people, focus on filling up on the good stuff first. So instead of thinking about everything you have to eliminate, focus on what you need to add. So whenever I take on a new coaching student, first thing we do is we're going to fill up on lean protein. We're going to fill up on lots of vegetables. We're going to fill up on essential fatty acids. We're going to fill up on all that good stuff first. Get that in. Because if you fill up on the good high nutrient quality foods first, you automatically have less room for the not so good foods afterwards. So I am actually a big fan of teaching people to fill up and satisfy their appetite with high nutrient foods and not getting obsessed with what they need to cut out. And it's, 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 a, it's a different approach, but I find it's, it's a better approach because you don't feel deprived. Like if, if I tell you to eat more protein, eat more vegetables, eat more fruits, eat, and you're eating more, right? Like the idea is I'm eating more, but you're eating more things that are actually going to help to increase your metabolism, help to build lean muscle, help to uh, aid with burning body fat. And it's just going to make you feel better and healthier versus if I tell you, hey, you got to cut out this and you got to cut out that and stop eating this and stop eating that. You, you feel like you're being deprived. Whereas I, I don't necessarily deprive people when I'm coaching them. I just try and fill them up on the good stuff first. And that naturally helps to wean them off some of the not so good stuff that they shouldn't be eating. But of course, there's going to be times, you know, like Thanksgiving. We just had Thanksgiving here in Canada last weekend. I mean, I ate till I was stuffed like the turkey was. Right? And I mean, I had I had the, uh, the, the dinner with all the fixings. I had dessert afterwards. I didn't hold back, right? Every now and then, like my birthday was, was earlier in the month. I went out for my birthday and, you know, we ate, I had dessert. I enjoyed myself. So every now and then I will still splurge and get, you know, have whatever I want to kind of get that out of my system. But most of the time, say like 80 or 90% of the time, I'm sticking to a clean diet and focusing on filling up on those good, natural, unprocessed, wholesome foods that are going to be moving me in the right direction versus always worrying about what you have to cut out. And again, it's just a little mindset shift, but it, it, I find it's, it's easier to follow when you can think in terms of having an abundance of good quality food versus always kind of worrying about what you're not allowed to eat. Uh, Brandon is joining us. Robert is joining us. How's it going, guys? Um, Carl's got a question. How do you increase your bench press fast with long arms? Well, first off, stop trying to worry about increasing your bench press fast. Uh, that's basically, uh, more or less, that's a recipe for probably ending up with a pec tear or strained shoulders or rotator cuff issues or whatever. Think of being in this for the long game right? Like a lot of people, oh, I want to do something as fast as possible. Think of how can you increase your bench press slow and steady and consistently over the long term? That's a better question. Uh, as far as the whole long arms issue, it, it still comes down to technique, right? You need to learn how to bench press with proper technique. And there's a way to position your body. There's a way to retract your shoulder blades and shorten the stroke of the bench press and not only shorten it, but help to bench press so that you're in a mechanically stronger and safer position. I've got a video on YouTube, uh, how to bench press with proper technique. I think that's what it's called. If you just do a search for Lee Hayward, how to bench press with proper technique, you'll find it. It's actually one of my most popular videos. It's got like over a million views and uh, probably even multiple million views. I, re I really don't know, but it's, it's, uh, I'm, it's definitely over a million views. So it's very popular, obviously. And it's a video that I made a while back. It's it's not a new video. It's probably eight or nine years old or more. So uh, it's been around for a while, but it's it's a good one and it explains the whole process of how to properly set up to bench press so that you're placing your shoulders in a safer position, reducing your risk of having a pec tear or a rotator cuff strain, and also increasing the weights that you're lifting at the same time. So watch that video, go over it, study it, watch it several times, and that will definitely help. And, th and that applies regardless if, if you're a tall guy with long arms or even if you're a short, stocky guy. A lot of the same techniques apply because we're trying to bench press in the most optimal fashion uh, to stimulate maximum muscle growth, increase strength, 
and to also do it as safe as possible. All right, AJ's got a question here. He says, uh, for weight loss, I'm thinking of doing a circuit sort of thing, just starting out three sets, eight to 15 reps. So it would be straight bar deadlifts to row, to curl, shrugs, military press, calf raises. What are your thoughts of this style of workout? I'm a big fan of just changing up your workouts in general. And, and I'm going to tell you something. Fat loss, it doesn't matter if, if you're doing a circuit routine, if you're doing a five by five, if you're doing powerlifting, if you're doing Olympic lifting, if you're doing bodybuilding, CrossFit, like you can do any weight training, strength training type of program that you want and still lose fat. What's going to determine whether it's a fat loss program or not isn't the exercises, the sets, the reps, or whatever that you do in the gym. It's the diet that you follow it with, right? Prime example, you, you look at some power lifters who compete and are trying to stay in a certain weight class or maybe cut weight to compete in a lower weight class. Some of these guys get super lean and defined, like borderline almost the same level of conditioning that you would see in, in like competitive bodybuilders who are prepping for a competition in some cases. And they're still training heavy. They're still training to get stronger in the gym. Right? They're doing their powerlifting programs or like Olympic lifters. Some of these guys, again, same thing, especially if they're the, the ones who are trying to stay in a certain weight class. Some of these guys are super ripped and shredded and they're still training for strength and power. So they're doing their heavy, low rep training just the same as if they were trying to maximize size. So the workout itself is not what's going to determine your fat loss. It's the diet that you follow it up with. Now, with that being said, you can certainly change up your workouts. I mean, I change them up all the time, like within reason. I, I mean, I don't like literally change it all the time. I usually stick to a set program for anywhere from one to two months is usually what I like to do personally. If I'm making good progress with a program, I'm enjoying it and it, it just feels good and, and I'm seeing steady gains, then I'll stick with it for as long as I can. I mean, if I, I'm making progress for two months, great, I'll stick with it for two months. If I follow a program and after a few weeks, I'm like, you know, it's I, wrote, I don't really like this, um, you know, the, the motivation's not there, or, or maybe I'm just feeling like I'm hitting a plateau, then I'll change it up. But bottom line, adjust your training based on how your body's responding. If, if you've got a good program going and you're enjoying it, you're seeing steady gains, then milk that sucker for what it's worth. Ride that wave of momentum for as long as you can. But once you do find that you are hitting a plateau and you feel like, hey, it's, it's time for a change, then don't hesitate to change. Like I see that a lot. Like some people, they get, they kind of just, just get hooked up on a program and they're like, oh, I don't know if I should change my program or not. I'm like, why not? Like, you can do whatever you want when you go to the gym, right? You have total freedom and flexibility. If you, if you want to change it up, then go ahead, change it up. You know, you don't have to be, uh, it's not like you're in a long-term relationship with a workout program, right? You can change it up if you want and, and stimulate some new and unique muscle growth. But again, what's going to determine whether it's a muscle building program, weight gain, fat loss, whatever, it's the diet that you follow it up with, not what you're doing in the gym. Let's see what else we got. If you could only do five exercises for the rest of your life, what would they be and why? I'm assuming we're talking about strength training exercises. Five exercises. One, I mean, if, if you want to consider it, I mean, like walking, I would definitely want to walk for the rest of my life because that's kind of like the most common thing. But I, I don't think that's what you're getting at. Um, I think you're talking about weight training. What would be my five exercises? I would just stick to some of the most basic moves. Pull-ups, I love pull-ups, I would do pull-ups. Push-ups, I would definitely have those in there. Squats, definitely have that in there. Deadlifts, definitely have that in there. Probably an overhead press would be my fifth exercise. If, you know, just, kind of top of my head. I mean, that's, that's what I'm thinking. But guess what? You don't have to limit yourself to five exercises. We have a whole gym full of equipment that we can do. We have dozens, if not hundreds of exercise variations. So we're not limited to five, but 
that's that if I had to do five, those would be the ones that I would choose. Okay, Andy is joining us. He says, unfortunately, I cannot do traditional squats due to shoulder issues. Can you recommend good alternatives? There's some different squat bars available. You can probably, one, it's called a safety squat bar. Now, I know it's probably not very common in all gyms. We have one at, at Platinum Fitness that I train at. But that's a, a variation that, it, the way it positions, there's... It's still a, a barbell, but it has pads that come out and it literally sits on your shoulders. So it's, it's, a, it's a nice variation. Just do a Google search for safety squat bar. Uh, if you have access to that, or if, if you're training in your home gym, you could buy one for your home gym. That may uh, feel better. And, and if you are training at your home gym, don't try one first before you, in, you know, invest and buy one for yourself because I mean, it may not work for you, <laughs> right? I always. If whenever you're buying equipment for a home gym, it's better to just try it in advance to make sure that you actually like it and can use it before you actually invest money in it. Uh, other squat variations, I mean, like even hack squats, you know, you can do that at the gym uh, because usually the hack squat machine doesn't have you in the same rigid shoulder plane of motion that you are when you're uh, using a barbell. You can even get the cambered squat bars, like the, the ones like the Buffalo bar is the name of one that's common in powerlifting, but it's actually an angled squat bar and it, it rounds over your upper back and it's easier on the shoulders. Uh, so that's another variation. And of course you could always just try doing different squat variations like the goblet squat. You know, you could try front squats, but quite honestly, I mean, that may be even harder on your shoulders again. Again, I don't know your whole uh, shoulder issue, what it is that you're suffering from, but a lot of people find front squats can be a bit uncomfortable, but you might want to try it and see if it works for you. And of course, if, if that doesn't work, you can always do other exercises. I mean, like the leg press, that's a great alternative to squats. Like you don't have to squat to make progress. I know like a lot of people say, well, the squat's the king of exercises. You know, you got to squat, squat big or go home or whatever. But the, the truth of the matter is like, you don't have to squat. If, if you can't squat for whatever reason, you can still do other moves. Right? You can do leg presses, you can do leg extensions, you can do leg curls, you can do lunges, you can do step ups. You know, there's, there's a lot of leg exercises that are still going to work all the same major muscle groups. And as long as you're working the muscles, like that's all that really matters. I mean, the only time you have to squat is if you're like a competitive power lifter or you're a competitive uh, Olympic lifter who has to squat. Other than that, if you're just in there trying to work out so that you're healthy, fit and in shape, there's, there's no law saying thou must squat, right? No, you, you can do other exercises instead and still still get great results, still be lean, healthy, and fit, and, and you know, build muscular legs in the same time. I mean, I know a lot of competitive bodybuilders who've, you know, built very impressive physiques, built big legs, and never squat. All right, let's see what else we got. This is from Dan. Uh, he says... He says, Guinness, Guinness is low in calories, high in iron. Doctors here in Ireland regularly recommend one bottle a day. I'm um, right. I, I'm sure they would, right? The doctors in Ireland would recommend drinking Guinness. Why not? Personally, I don't drink Guinness, and I, I think I'm quite fine. I'm not going to start drinking Guinness because someone says it's a good source of iron. There's, I, I'd rather have a piece of... I'd rather have a steak, right? Steak's a good source of iron. <laughs> uh, RC is joining us. He says, I'm at work. Wouldn't miss it for anything. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you don't get in trouble, right? Like your, your boss or whoever's, you know, your supervisor. Like, what are you doing there, right? And, right? I'm sure they're not paying you to watch my video chat, but I appreciate the support nonetheless. Uh, Jason is joining us. Hey, Jason. Okay, another question here. This one's, uh, how long for a beginner to see significant gains hitting the gym three days a week with proper nutrition? Honestly, you're going to see progress. Like what I mean by progress is noticeable visual signs that you're actually moving in the right direction. Like you can literally see that on a weekly basis. Now, and what I, the most obvious thing that you're going to see is strength gains, especially for a beginner. It's very possible to make strength gains on a weekly basis where you're getting an extra 
rep on an exercise, you know, extra rep per set, uh, adding an extra five pounds to the barbell, things like that. You're going to see strength gains, uh, on, especially on your big major compound lifts, increasing fairly consistently. You're also going to feel your work capacity and your energy levels increasing fairly consistently. Uh, but as far as noticeable physical changes, within three months, you're going to be able to see some, some solid changes. Like what, one of my coaching students, I just had a conversation with him uh, uh, yesterday. It was Yeah, it was yesterday. His name is Graham. And he's in his 50s, and he just started working out with me. And within, I think it's all two or three months now he's been working with me and like he's added over an inch to his arms added over an inch to his shoulders lost over an inch on his waistline I, I don't know the exact numbers but like his upper body is getting bigger his waistline is getting smaller he's noticing strength gains on a regular basis like seems like every time he's going to the gym he's adding an extra five pounds here and there getting an extra rep per set and he's just feeling really good and healthy he's fitness levels improving he's He's eating better. I mean, there's, there's so much progress happening. And again, it's only been like a couple months. So yeah, you can see noticeable changes fairly quickly. But to get to the point where you look like a bodybuilder, where per people on the street are just going to say, you know, I, dude, how long you been lifting for? Like, obviously you work out. To get to that point where it's obvious that you work out and you've got more muscle mass than the average person, it's going to take at least a year or a couple years of consistent training to get to that level. And generally, this is how it works. Your first year of good, solid, consistent training, and I'm not talking about this on and off crap that you hear so many people say, well, I've been working out on and off or however, whatever. Because whatever progress you make while you're on, you're gonna lose while you're off. So it's just, you know, you're, you're gaining and re-losing the same muscle over and over again. But if you stick to a solid workout schedule, a solid nutrition plan and you do so right fairly consistently like at least three plus times a week you're in the gym with your nutrition you're, you're following it at least 80 percent of the time so that you're actually moving yourself in the right direction and making solid progress you're going to make your best gains in your first year of solid training in your second year of training you can expect to make about half the gains that you did in your first year in your third year, you're probably going to make about half the gains that you did in your second year. And that's kind of like how it goes after a while. It's like as the more muscle you gain, the less opportunity you have to gain more muscle, right? If, if that makes sense. So that's why you'll very often see like advanced bodybuilders or advanced lifters. Like they're fighting for an extra five pounds on a lift, right? They're fighting to gain an extra five pounds of muscle, whereas a beginner could gain that, you know, in the matter of, you know, a, a couple months. So uh, just, just keep that in mind. The longer you're at this, the slower the progress is going to come. And it's usually, you know, each year you can kind of cut it in half of what you gained the previous year. That's, that's pretty standard. All right, where else we do... Have you ever done a workout video with blocks or bench blocks? Uh, no, I don't think I have. I've used board presses, but I've never used bench blocks. And, okay, well, this one is from Metado Health. I think that's the name. Hello, Lee. Long time no see. Uh, you look more interesting wearing glasses. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Frederick is joining us. He said, what is the best tricep exercise, close grip bench press formats? Uh, the best tricep exercise, man, it's, I don't like limiting yourself to one exercise because each exercise has, there's advantages and, and to, to different moves, different ranges of motion. The best that I would recommend for actually stimulating muscle growth is using what's known as positions of flexion. And that's using three different ranges of motion. So mid-range, fully stretched, peak contraction. I've got videos up on YouTube now. I've got a playlist covering this. I've, I've talked about this for years. But when it comes to all the different styles of training, this is one that I keep coming back to over and over again. Or I'll even implement it within different training programs because it is one of the best systems for building muscle mass, stimulating muscle growth. And how it works is, let, let's just use triceps for an example. 
you would start with a mid-range compound exercise. So the close grip bench press could be a great example of that. That is an exercise where you can handle a lot of weight. Uh, you're working the muscle through that mid-range, meaning you're not getting a full stretch in the bottom and you can usually lock it out at the top. So all the tension is in the middle of the exercise. And so again, the, the close grip bench press, prime example of that. A fully stretched exercise would be something like, maybe like an overhead tricep extension where you let the dumbbell hang all the way down and you fully stretch out the triceps in the bottom. That would be an example of a, of a fully stretched move. You could even also look at like a, a, a skull crusher or something like that where you're, you're lowering the, the arms all the way down and stretching out the, the muscle. It's an exercise where even in the bottom range of motion, the muscle is still being stretched and there's active tension in the muscles in the bottom range of motion. But usually with a fully stretched exercise, you can lock it out at the top as well. So in the case of like overhead dumbbell extension, you lower it down, you're even in the bottom, like if you, you resting in the bottom, you're still getting that stretch. But then when you lock it out at the top, you can kind of get a little rest at the top. So that would be a fully uh, stretched exercise. Uh, the next one would be a peak contraction move. And a prime example of that for triceps would be like a kickback, dumbbell kickback, cable kickback, something like that. There's not a lot of tension in the bottom. There's not a fully stretched position where you're getting the stretch. The mid range, you know, you are getting some tension in the mid range, but the peak contraction is where you really got to fight. So in the case of like a dumbbell kickback, you really have to fight to hold that lockout position at the top of the repetition. So going through those three ranges of motion, mid range, fully stretched, peak contraction uh, would be the best way to work all the ranges of motion for maximum muscle growth and hypertrophy. And I, I like to incorporate that with a lot of different workout programs. All right, let's see what else we got. Who are your top three favorite Mr. Olympia competitors of all time? Hmm, well, you're going to have to put Arnold in there. I mean, like, I don't think anybody can say, well, I'm sure they can, but I, I'm an Arnold fan. Like, Arnold Schwarzenegger was the first bodybuilder that I ever seen. And I, it wasn't even bodybuilding. I seen him when he did the Conan the Barbarian movies. And I can remember, you know, seeing that, like that was the first time I ever seen a man with muscles, not counting like comic book characters. And I was just blown away that, whoa, like he's a real man in the flesh with muscles. Whereas before that, I'm looking at like Superman comics and, and all that kind of stuff. And I didn't really, you know, okay, yeah, they got muscles in the comics, but do real men have these kind of muscles? And then when I was seeing... Conan the Barbarian, I'm like, holy crap, like Arnold with muscles, like that had such an impact on me because it was the first time that I ever seen, you know, a, a human being built like that. And I was just like, I want to look like that someday, right? That was my, right from the get go, I was like, man, that is so cool. I want to look like that. And that was my inspiration from a young age. So yeah, Arnold is definitely one of those guys. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Dorian Yates. I'm ever since, you know, he came on the scene and, and, and there was a kind of interesting because right when I was really in the, in the getting involved with bodybuilding, because I started competing in 1995, that's when Dorian Yates was the reigning Mr. Olympia. And so like all through my early bodybuilding competitive days, Dorian Yates was the reigning Mr. Olympia and he was in all the magazines and I bought his VHS program and stuff like that. You know, the blood and guts VHS tape when it came out. And I, I, that had a big impact on me. I was a huge fan of Dorian, still am, right? I, I like how he's matured in his, as he's gotten older and as he's retired from bodybuilding and stuff. I mean, just, I just have a lot of respect for the man. I really do. He's, he's just a very level-headed, down-to-earth, no BS type of guy. And, um, you know, I've, I've gotten a lot of, uh, a lot of insights from just listening to him. And I had the opportunity to meet him a few times at the, uh, like at the Arnold Classic at the Expo and stuff like that. And, and you can tell, like when you meet somebody in person, even though like, it's not a huge conversation, like you may be chatting for like five minutes max, but still you can just tell he's a genuine, no BS. It's like, what you see is what you get. He's not there to try and put on a show or impress anybody. He's just like, this is who I am, right? And he's just like, got that years of experience of, of hard work and you just know like you're you're talking to a guy who who practices what he preaches walks you know walks the talk and again huge huge respect for him right uh who would be the third one mm. 
those two those two had the biggest impact like I, i'm a big fan of a lot of olympia competitors but who else would there be uh, i honestly I, I don't really have a, a a big favorite like no no other mr olympia champion really had a, a major impact on me like arnold did obviously you've seen that's the first time i ever seen a man with muscles and of course dorian just his you know the 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 working man, thinking man's bodybuilder, right? Like, I mean, I just really got a lot from him. But as far as the other guys, I mean, yeah, I, I've watched a lot of stuff that Ronnie's done and Jay Cutler and and that, but, you know, and even Phil Heath, but they didn't really have a, a major impact on me uh, like like Dorian and, and, of course, Arnold did. So I, I really, I, I, the other guys, I'd have to put them all in a, their own class. I mean, not, not to take anything away from them or to be disrespectful. It's just, I'm being honest, right? You asked me who my uh, biggest inspirations are when it comes to Olympia competitors. And those are the ones, uh, make more outdoors videos. Okay. We'll do. I'll add it to the to-do list. <laughs> Jennifer is joining us. Hey Lee, let's see the calves. I got pants on. I'm not taking my pants off to see my calves. And of course, my calves are too big that I can't roll up the pants from the bottom. <laughs> I'm not dropping my pants on camera. It's not that type of video. <laughs> this is PG. <laughs> uh, Frederick's joining us. He says, is ZMA a good supplement? Why is it so popular? Supplement does it really help with fatigue? Look, Yes, ZMA is a good supplement, but it's nothing magical. It's zinc, magnesium, and B6. I mean, these are all essential minerals and, well, you know, zinc and magnesium and minerals and B, B6 is a vitamin. I mean, you need that stuff, absolutely, but there's, you know, there's really nothing magical about ZMA, right? If, if you're getting adequate, you know, vitamins and minerals through other means, then you'll, you'll still get the results. Now, I personally supplement with magnesium. I personally supplement with zinc and I take a B complex. I don't take a ZMA product, but I take all those supplements separately and individually. And it's, it's not necessarily like, it's not some magical formula. Okay. You take that and boom, you're, you're, you're going to be huge and jacked or whatever. It's just vitamin and mineral support. Like your body needs that stuff. If you have a vitamin or mineral deficiency, that's going to short term, short change your progress in the gym. Like you're not going to be able to uh, recover the same. You're not going to function the same. Like your body does not function the same as if you have any of these deficiencies. But if you have optimal levels of vitamins and minerals, then everything just works the way it's supposed to. Like prime example, when I was younger, uh, back in my uh, early days when I started working out, I, I had an iron deficiency. Now, I didn't know it at the time. It's just, you know, through regular checkups and blood work through my doctor is how I found out about it. But when I... You know, at the time I was constantly tired and, and just feeling like I was dragging my ass. And I just figured maybe I'm overtraining, you know, maybe I'm not getting enough sleep or maybe whatever, you know, I just had all these things. But then when we got the blood work and realized, whoa, I got low iron. And then the doctor said, well, you know, you should start eating more red meat, uh, eat more liver, eat more whole eggs. You know, these are all good sources of iron. And at the time I was so uh, like following the... The, the clean bodybuilding diets, like I was eating a lot of chicken, I was eating a lot of uh, white fish, I was, you know, eating no, no whole eggs, just eating the egg whites, and, and, you know, trying to eat a low fat, healthy, like bodybuilding diet, especially back in the, in the early 90s, they were really preaching the whole low fat thing. So that's the type of diet I followed. And I was, I wasn't getting enough iron. So that my doctor said, well, you know, red meat, fantastic source of iron liver the best food source of iron there is like a meal of liver is like you know you get more iron in a meal of liver than you will in like a handful of iron supplements so he said eat more of that and whole eggs so that's the stuff i ate and i basically cured my iron deficiency by just eating red meat and whole eggs uh, you know some combination thereof every single day and then afterwards once i kind of corrected it, I, I was supplementing with the multivitamin that had iron in it to ensure that i maintain my iron level but once i corrected that deficiency i felt so much better i had energy i felt like i was bouncing off the walls and i was you know it can make better gains in the gym and everything else so that's the whole purpose of vitamin and minerals is you just want to make sure that you have optimal levels for your body to function its best 
right? It's not like you're going to, if, if you have healthy levels of vitamins and minerals now and you start supplementing them, well, that's kind of like an insurance policy to keep healthy levels, but you're not really going to notice anything. It's not like, you know, you're going to add an inch to your biceps because you're taking ZMA, right? No, it's not going to work like that. But if you have a deficiency in zinc or magnesium or the B vitamins, and then you, you correct that deficiency, then yeah, you'll probably notice it. So that, that's the, the key. You want to have adequate vitamins and minerals there so that you meet your body's requirements. But they're not, you're not really going to notice a muscle building benefits simply by taking vitamin and minerals. Uh, what else we got there? Um, da, 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 da. Diet depends if person is mesomorph, ectomorph, etc. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that's a, a question <laughs> versus a statement. But yes, typically, if, if you're a skinny ectomorph, meaning like you're, you're naturally tall, skinny, then yeah, you want to try and force or not force, focus on uh, eating higher calories to try and pack on some size to your frame. Vice versa, if you're overweight and you have that endomorphic tendencies, then you probably want to focus on fat loss. So I know a lot of people say, oh, there's no such thing as an endomorph or an ectomorph or a mesomorph or whatever. But bottom line, there are different body types. Like we all know people who are naturally skinny and we all know people who are overweight. And it's not all due to diet and exercise and lifestyle, even though that has a huge impact. Don't get me wrong, but like that has a huge impact. But a prime example, like you look at uh, people who live in a controlled environment, for example, like you look at prison inmates, right? They're in a controlled environment. They're all eating the same type of food. Like nobody really has a any advantage. Like, you know, you, they can't go out to the all you can eat buffet or they can't be ordering in pizza and stuff like that, or at least not regularly, <laughs> right? I mean, maybe they have pizza night some days or whatever, but th th everybody's basically on the same diet. Yet you'll have people who are fat, you have people who are skinny, you'll have all different body shapes and sizes. So body type does matter regardless of lifestyle, right? You, your body type, your genetics do play a role. However, you know, you can adjust it and manipulate it based on your diet and exercise and lifestyle choices. So if you're naturally a, a skinny guy and you're struggling to gain weight, then of course you want to try and eat a higher calorie diet and fill out your frame with lean muscular body weight. And if you're you know, you're heavy set, then obviously, yeah, you want to do the opposite. You want to be in a calorie deficit and focus on, uh, you know, expending more energy, more cardio to try and burn off that extra body fat. And then if you're somewhere in the middle, you know, more of the mesomorph, you can basically focus on what it is that you want, whether it's gaining more size or, or losing body fat, because you're kind of, you know, you're in that sweet spot in the middle where you can kind of optimize based on how you, what it is that you want to focus on. All right, let's see what else we've got. Uh, do... Okay, some questions here. Mohammed is joining us. He says, Lee, is that the real, sorry, is that real that we should get rest two weeks or month after use whey protein for three months or can we use it all year round? You can take protein supplements all year round. Uh, how long should you stick to a protocol? I'm not sure what you mean. Can you give me an example of a protocol that you're s sticking with? <laughs> yeah, someone's saying as long as it's effective. Yeah, that's pretty much the answer right there. How long should you stick to a protocol? I guess it mean how long should you stick to a workout? How long should you stick to a diet or, or whatever? Yeah, for as long as it's working for you. I mean, and, and then to be aware of that as soon as it stops working for you and you actually know that it's it's stop working that's just not you're not being consistent because this is one thing i i gotta throw this out there like a lot of times people will follow a diet or something they say, oh uh, you know I'm, I'm following keto and it's not working for me i say well how long have you been following keto uh since last friday i'm like okay so it's you know you're almost a week in or maybe you're two weeks in yeah it's not working for me you haven't given yourself long enough or they'll say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm following a five by five program. It's not working for me. How long have you been doing it for? You know, oh, about three weeks now. Like you got to give something some time in order for it to work. It's not like you're going to you know, cut your carbs today and be shredded tomorrow. Like, or it's not like you're going to follow a new workout program today and be jacked by this time next week. Right. You have to give whatever it is you're following some time to work. 
But at the same time, you don't want to be like following a program for months on end and you like you haven't made progress in three months and you've been following this thing for the past six months and you're like three months of just total flat line no progress whatsoever and you've been consistent like don't go beating your head against the wall doing the same thing over and over again if it's not working right you have to have that you know insight to know when it's time to change things up and of course that's where having an experienced coach in your corner can really help because a lot of times if people are in a plateau, it's not that their program is wrong or anything like that. It's very often they're not consistent or they haven't been following the thing long enough. But for those who are consistent, those who are following a program and you, you truly do need to change it up, which which does happen, right? And which does happen. That's where having a coach who has the experience and that outside set of eyes looking in can really help. Like I remember one of my uh, coaching students, uh, Joe was getting ready for his first bodybuilding show. This was a few years back now. Joe has been a regular student of mine for, for years. He's been a part of our Total Fitness Bodybuilding Inner Circle. And he's still in there. He's still in there every day posting his workouts and stuff like that. He's one of the most consistent guys that I know. So big shout out, Joe, if you're watching this, right? Proud of you, buddy. Uh, anyway, Joe was getting ready for his first bodybuilding show. And I know just from following, like he's consistent. He's in the gym five days a week guaranteed like spot on like you could he's like a machine in terms of consistency so he's in there he's doing his thing and he was following a fat loss program right low calorie contest cutting diet he was doing his cardio he was doing his workouts and i knew he was consistent because he was posting his, his training program on a regular basis so i mean i knew he was doing what he said he was doing and he got to the point where it's like he was just not making any progress. Like his fat loss had totally plateaued, even though he was in a calorie deficit, even though he was working out, you know, five times a week, even though he was doing daily cardio and everything else, like he was doing everything right, but he just was not making progress. And it was like a flat line plateau for like a couple of weeks. There was just nothing happening. And I said, Joe, you, you, you basically, what we need to do is we need to kind of like reset your metabolism here. So I said, stop cardio, slack off the weight training, go on a deload phase and purposely increase your calories for the next week. So I want it to be almost like you're doing a clean bulk with very low volume of training for the next week. We're just going to kind of reset your metabolism, reset your body. And he did that. And of course, when he did, he gained weight, like within that week, he probably put on 10 pounds, right? Just from the extra, you know, glycogen from the, the foods that he was eating, from the you know the reduced training volume from cutting out the cardio like he literally put on about 10 pounds in a week and i said trust me on this like have faith in me trust the process and he says okay he trusted me and he did it and then after a week of higher calories lower training just doing a whole deload and basically giving his body a chance to rest and recover then i said all right let's go back into what you were doing before so let's bump up the cardio again let's go back on the, the low calorie diet get yourself back into a calorie surplus and then within two weeks after that, he was making progress again. So it was like taking one step back to take two steps forward. But he did that and then he, he reset his metabolism and he just started making progress all over again. But if he had kept doing what he was doing, he was stuck in a plateau and he was just basically burning himself out. So sometimes you need to have that insight to know, okay, when, do you sh when should you put pedal to the metal? When should you ease back and give yourself time to rest, recover and grow? Right. So you, you, that's where having a, a coach and more, you know, the outside set of eyes with the experience can really help. So in, in Joe's case, it, that was the key that he needed to, in order to bust past his plateau that he was stuck in. And I've used that strategy with a lot of guys. But at the same time, you have to be aware of where you are, like in terms of how long do you stick to something? Right? It, it, it's really an individual thing. There's not like a one size fits all cookie cutter answer to say, like, you know, stick to it for a week, two weeks for a month two months like it depends on the individual and of course depends on, on the progress that you're getting anyway that was a long-winded answer to uh i even forget what the question was <laughs> all right let's move on where were we to oh shit let's see um is zma good for sleep i mean you can take it before sleep but i mean again it's it's, it's zinc magnesium you know and, and b6 it's not magic right some people find it helps them sleep better, but it's, you know, I tell you, if, if you want, you know what the best thing for sleep is? 
turning off all your electronic devices like two hours before you go to bed, right? Dimming the lights before you go to bed, like kind of like purposely set yourself up to go to bed, unwind, cut out all the, the artificial stimulation that's coming in because that, that's a, a big hindrance. Like a lot of people are on their computers or on their phones or they're watching TV and they got all this stimulation or they're playing video games right up until the point of going to sleep. I mean, you're stimulating the crap out of yourself right up until the point then you're, you're trying to go to sleep and then you're wondering why you can't sleep, right? Like visualize like playing some of these video games. So you're getting the, the visual stimulation, the mental stimulation and the, you know, the, the lights and the sounds and everything else and you're all playing games and then you say, oh, it's time to go to bed. Like, no, you, you just can't shut it off like that. You have to give your body time to rest and, and relax and unwind. So purposely in the evening, shut off the electronic devices at least an hour before you go to bed, at least an hour, preferably even more. And then if you want to do something in the evening to entertain yourself, read a book or, or something like that, something that's actually going to relax you and, and not get you all wired and stimulated with artificial lights and sounds and blah, blah, blah. Right. That's the stuff that I, I would recommend if you're having trouble sleeping. Right. Don't go thinking, well, what, what, what's the pill that I can take? Right. Change your lifestyle habits. That's the step one. Anyway, let's move on. What else have we got? Um, but it, uh, can you say hi to my friend, Nick? Hi, Nick. <laughs> uh, let's see. Wasif. Was Wasif, I think his name is. Tips for sleep and the best meal to have before going to sleep. Well, I just gave you some tips for sleep then. As far as the best meal before, it basically something that's not going to upset your stomach. Like I, I personally have to eat before I go to bed, right? If, if I try to go to bed on an empty stomach, I, I usually don't sleep well. So I like to eat something, but at the same time, I don't want it to be heavy or gassy or cause me to feel bloated or whatever. So for me, I mean, it could be Man, like I'll vary it up, but like some, sometimes I'll have like high protein oatmeal before I go to bed. You know, I, I find that something like that helps me to sleep better. Um, you know, sometimes I'll have cottage cheese and whatever. I mean, I did a full day of eating if you want to check it out. Like uh, just to give you an example of what I eat throughout the day. Uh, that's actually one of the most recent videos that I posted. And that's it's very typical, but like at the same time, I'll, I'll vary it up. I mean, I don't always eat the same foods day in, day out, week in, week out, right? I mean, I'll change it up, but that's a, a very typical uh, day of eating that I would recommend. And that's what I follow myself. So if, if you want to see a sample of, of that, then just go back and check out that video on the main Total Fitness Bodybuilding YouTube channel. It was, um, it's, it's the first video posted there now. It's a full day of eating. Uh, let's see what else we got. From Mike, we have Mike joining us. He says, how's it going, Lee? This is my first time watching your live stream. Well, welcome, Mike. Glad to have you tuning in. And RC is joining us. He says, I hope everyone's achieving their goals and dreams. I, I hope so, too. <laughs> And we have Dan saying, I haven't been to the gym in a month. Well, guess what? Today is a good day to get back to the gym. Start now. Why wait? And when you're starting back, don't push yourself too much too soon. Like I have a basic beginner's workout program, a total body beginner's program right on my main YouTube channel. That would be a good place to, a uh, good one to get started with. Do that three days a week. And then on your off days, get outside and go for a walk. You don't need to make it any more complicated than that. Just get your ass in gear and do it. Uh, and that, that ties in perfectly to the next question here. This is one's from um, XXUnknown. It says, would you recommend a beginner's full body program or what? For a beginner, or for that matter, anybody who's getting back into the gym, full body program three days a week. Keep it simple. One major exercise per muscle group. Don't overcomplicate it. Just focus on the habit of showing up to the gym. Quite honestly, I really don't care what you do for your first month back to the gym, just as long as you're going. But if you want to, you know, make the best of it, a beginner's total body workout, just like the one that I've posted on my main YouTube channel there, do that three days a week, every other day. And on your days off, get outside and go for a walk for at least 30 minutes. Boom. Simple as that. Don't overcomplicate it. Don't worry about 
adding in more variables and oh should i do this should i be training to failure should i be doing drop sets and supersets and I'm like no just just show up to the gym like seriously don't make it any more complicated than it needs to be one of the problems a lot of people make is there's so much information out there and they they make it too complicated like keep it simple right if, if you're not going to the gym then guess what the next step is to get to the gym <laughs> seriously don't make it any more complicated than it needs to be uh, we got Mark joining us from Australia. He wants to know high or low reps, meaning 15 to 20 or 6 to 10 for longevity joint care while still building muscle. Both. It really depends on the exercise. There are certain exercises that work well for very high reps. There are certain exercises that work well for low reps. Um, typically, the, the bigger the exercise, it tends to work better for low reps, right? The, the, like isolation moves tend to work better for high reps. But with that being said, there, there's advantages to doing the complete opposite from time to time. Like the, the 20 rep squat program, for example. I mean, that's high reps and a compound exercise and it works pretty darn good. So it, there, there's, there's really no right or wrong answer for that. It's, as far as longevity, what's going to come into play there is lifting within your means, warming up properly before your exercises and knowing when to uh, knowing when to throw in the towel, right? Like this whole no pain, no gain. Like, I don't believe in that one little bit. <laughs> if I'm feeling pain, that's usually because something's not right, especially if it's joint pain. Now, there's a difference when the pain that you get, like, okay, you're getting a pump and you're feeling lactic acid burn or something like that. That's, that's, that's good pain, right? Or, you know, you're, you're exerting yourself and you're feeling, okay, you know, you, you're sweating, you're panting, you're, you know, you're, 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 you're working out, right? You're, that's, I don't even consider that pain. That's just, you know, the, the exerting effort, right? That's just, but pain in terms of like a sharp shooting pain, something that just does not feel right. That's not good. So if, if you're doing an exercise and like you get knee pain or you're doing an exercise and elbow pain or chest pain or shoulder pain, like something like that, you had to be aware of that and work around it. Like pain is not good. This whole no pain, no gain, that's, that's a crock of shit. <laughs> you have to be aware of the pain. And when you do have it, work around it the best you can. And uh, the best thing that I've found, um, in addition to proper warm-ups, you know, lifting within your means, like knowing when to call it quits. Like if I'm doing something and I, I, I don't feel right, like, man, I, I just, my, my, my joints are hurting or something's just not feeling right. I have no problem scrapping the exercise, doing something else. Or in some cases, I'll even scrap the workout and just go home. Like when it comes to longevity in the sport, there's nothing going to slow you down more than an injury. I've mentioned this over and over again, but it bears repeating. Like you can have a bad workout, right? You know, or you can skip a workout, right? You can cheat on your diet. Like all these little things, I mean, they're not necessarily good, but they're not going to hinder your progress in the greater scheme of things, right? You know, if you miss a workout in the gym, big deal. You can always go back and work out the next day, right? You cheat on your diet, big deal, right? You can always, you know, get back on track the next day. But if you get injured, that is definitely going to slow your progress because an injury could take weeks or months or in some cases it may never fully recover depending on the severity of the injury. Like if you, if you do have something serious like you snap a tendon or you tear a muscle or whatever, that, that could haunt you for the rest of your life. Right. Like you see guys with pec tears that never fully recover. And they've always got this deformed pec for the rest of their life or people who've, you know, blown their patella tendons and they've got knee pain for the rest of their life or, or something like that. Right. Like injury prevention is the key to longevity in this sport. So you have to be smart, listen to your body. And if something doesn't feel right, don't push through the pain. Right. Listen to them. All right. Let's see what else we got there. Um, but it, Brandon's still at work and he says he's getting paid to join in the live chat with Lee Hayward. Hashtag winning. I just hope your boss doesn't find out and, and you know, get pissed at you, right? But I mean, if it's working for you, man, good for you. <laughs> uh, any thoughts on freezer cooking or microwaving leftover food? Will it still have the same nutrients as freshly cooked food freezer cooking i don't know what you mean by freezer cooking i've never cooked anything in the freezer in fact i've always used the freezer to refrigerate food so i know i'm maybe i'm missing something or i don't know 
As far as microwaving, I'm not a big fan of, of microwave food. Like I don't even own a microwave oven. I, I don't. Like if I'm going to reheat something, I usually reheat it in, in the oven, like the normal oven, or I might reheat it in a frying pan. But very often I don't like eating, like I, I very often cook things fresh and eat it fresh more often than not. Now I know that's not practical for everybody. And you know, sometimes you do have the heat stuff up in the microwave. I understand that for, for most people that's cool. But in, in my case, a lot of times, I, I don't, if, if I am going to heat something up, I'll just heat it up in the, in the regular oven or I'll probably like heat it up in, in the pan on the stove. But uh, I don't, I don't even have a microwave oven. Our microwave oven broke, oh shit, how long ago is it now? I think it was in 2014, our oven broke and we never got another microwave since. <laughs> Seriously. And, and I don't miss it. Like I really don't because the food that's cooked in a microwave tastes like crap. Like if, if you try and cook something in the microwave, it tastes like a boiled rubber boot. Like there, it, I always like to do proper cooking on the stove or in the oven or something like that or on the barbecue. I don't like food coming out of a microwave, right? It just doesn't taste good. And you know, I'm, I'm old school in that sense. So there, next question. <laughs> Uh, I'm afraid if I get old, what will happen to my body if I have much muscle? Sorry, English is not my first language. Well, that's, hey, first off, congratulations for being able to speak English. Like, I, I have huge respect for anybody who, who can speak another language because I feel like as a born in an English family in an English country speaking English and like English is kind of like one of the universal languages that you can communicate worldwide with. I feel that it's kind of made us lazy because I have a lot of respect when I see people who come from other countries or, or different languages and they learn to speak English. And then they, a lot of times they have multiple languages. Cause it's like, once you can speak it, once you learn another language then it's like, it's easier to pick up the next one. It's almost like once you learn one musical instrument, it's easier to pick up the next one. So I feel very lazy in, in that sense where I can only speak one language. So again, the fact that you're speaking, you know, multiple languages at least at least more than one i have huge respect for you man that is you know us, us english speaking people can get lazy sometimes anyway as far as your question you're wondering you're afraid of getting old and wondering what's going to happen if you have muscle on your body that's actually a good thing the more muscle you have the better it's going to be as you get old because it's going to help you to be stronger and, and keep your metabolism elevated like all these things, like uh, there, there's myths and misconceptions that have been preached and, and I want to kind of address it now. And this is probably the last question that I'm going to go on, go off the video chat with because we've been doing this for over an hour now and my phone battery is almost dead. But when I was younger, I, re I remember a lot of the old people and what I mean by old is like I'm talking about parents. Like I was younger and I started working out when I was 12 years old and a lot of my aunts and uncles and relatives and even school teachers were like, well, don't build too much muscle because, you know, once you stop working out, all that muscle is going to turn to fat. I'm like, like where's the logic in that? Like, what, what do you mean? Like, don't build too much muscle because it's going to turn to fat. Or like, you know, don't build too much muscle because if you get older, then, you know, like, that's, that's so stupid. The more muscle you have on the frame, you know, I mean, the, the more, the faster your metabolism is going to be, the stronger you're going to be, the healthier you're going to be. Like nowadays we have, you know, doctors and healthcare professionals who are encouraging people to work out as they get older. Like they just don't roll over and, and die or, or say, oh, you, now you're, you're 60 years old. You have to spend the rest of your days in a rocking chair, right? <laughs> like, no, people are going to the gym and trying to strength train and, and build their bodies well into their senior years. Like, I've, I've got guys that I've worked with, like coaching students in their 60s and 70s, and even some in their 80s. And they would put some of the young people to shame in what they can do. I mean, we, you should be trying to exercise and strength train and keep yourself healthy as long as possible, like literally do it well into your senior years and beyond. It's not like something that you're only doing as a young person, like work out as long as you physically can move. I mean, what the day that you stop working out is the day when you're bedridden and you're just kind of like counting off the days when you're going to, you know, kick the bucket. 
But as long as you are physically able to move and, and active, then keep doing it. Like it's not like something you. All, all those stupid myths and misconceptions that used to be around, like thinking, oh, you know, don't build too much muscle or don't work out because oh, it might turn to fat. Like that's that's total BS. It has there's no rhyme or reason or it doesn't even make sense. Like muscle and tissue and fat tissue are two totally separate things. One does not become the other, right? So I mean, having this fear of oh, I don't want to build muscle because what happens when I get old? Like. What do you mean? Like the, the more muscle you have as you get old, then the stronger you're going to be as an old person. Like I would rather be a muscular old person than a weak and frail old person. Like because it's not just muscle you're building; you're also building bone density. You're strengthening your joints, your tendons, your ligaments. I mean, like these people that I've worked with, like I mean, guys who are um, like go to my uh, website. You know, I, I have a, a testimonial review of one guy. His name is Amo. Right, he's in his seventies. Right, and in, in his seventies, he actually got six pack abs. Right, I mean, it's it's crazy. Like he's kind of like my poster boy. I'm super proud of the guy. He's been a member of the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Inner Circle for years, but like, that's what I want to be. Like, shit, I would love to be able to be in my seventies, still working out and still have visible abdominal definition and, and look good. I mean, right, don't have this mind mindset of oh, just because you're getting older, you have to you know keel over and die right <laughs> that's not the attitude you want to be living a long healthy life into your senior years and and as long as possible so yeah that that there, there's no there's no basis in your fear of, of working out or trying to avoid building muscle because you don't know what's going to happen when you get older the more muscle you have the better you're going to be all right anyway guys i know there's a lot of questions coming through we have a good turnout today for today's video chat and uh but obviously I'm not going to be able to answer them all because it's getting late and I have to clue it up. Uh, but again, thank you for tuning in. Thanks for the support. And as always, what I'm going to be doing is I will have the replay of this with the timestamps for all the questions and I'll get that posted up this weekend. So uh, if you want to catch the replay, uh, you can certainly do so. And of course, next week, same time, same place, I'll be doing another live video chat. So have yourself a great weekend, and I will talk to you next week. Take care. Over and out.